if Russia learns in Ukraine that they can take what they want, they will take more and more and EU has to pay with the lives of their citizens. That is 100 times more expensive. Russia gets these lessons, the first Chechen war, right? They failed, they tried again, they won the war, they learned they can do it. Russia Georgian war, they took what they wanted, the West did not respond, they learned they can do it again. Then came 2014, they took Crimea in a huge poker gamble. The West reacted weakly, Russia learned we can do it again. 2022 February, full invasion, all this is the result of previously neglected Western response. Well, I'm glad we respond now, but we are late. But this has to be the last time, this has to be the moment we teach Russia they cannot take what they want, not from us, not from anyone, they're going down. Every year for the past two decades, a bunch of young people and hippies have gathered in the mountains of Ukraine to take psychedelics, dance around the fire, and spread a message of peace. This year, because of the war, the festival nearly didn't happen. But when they realized this could be the last chance for many of them to party before being conscripted, they figured, Putin, we're doing it anyway. To take the chance to have a youth far away from Russia's artillery. The week-long Ship It Festival has no official organizers. You have to hike through a waterfall to reach the location, and details are worked out over Telegram. Зараз іде жорстока агресивна війна, бо людський ресурс це не вічна сила. Це не є якась зрада, це відпочинок для того, щоб мати ті ресурси. Edik is a recently conscripted soldier who has decided to come to ship it on his day off. Atmosfera как там? Atmosfera как в детском лагере. Утром встал, покушал, взял автомат, пошёл 12 часов погулял, вернулся с Покушал, лег спать, взял автомат, пошел, постоял еще 12 часов. Three people in video game costumes have been killed by Russian secret police today so far. According to a Russian news outlet, three men who identified as Ukrainian saboteurs allegedly had plans to attack the local energy infrastructure, all of which were then killed at the scene by FSB agents. Only after the Moscow Times reported that the military gear found at the scene was not, in fact, re-military gear, but imitation prop gear designed to be from the video game Stalker. The only evidence uncovered supporting the FSB's narrative was the local airsoft club, which allegedly stated that two of the three men were banned from participating in games due to so robot like Russia is reusing manpower and taking a little bit less standards to who can leave the war and who can stay. This Russian soldier has his leg broken and he's in a ditch still on the battlefield. Don't forget you could easily leave with one leg or with two hands and crawl the way out. He ends up seeing a drone above him. You can see this on my on my Instagram account. And he just grabs the and you know does it to himself he gets rid of himself the ukrainian drone then makes sure that he is actually gone and double checks that he is actually gone the situation for these soldiers that from the russian side is so bad that they are just getting rid of themselves before the ukrainian army come after them i don't know but this is just getting really really wrong Somebody has to take out Putin and restore at least a little bit of dignity that the Russians had previously. Artillery <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Але я того вже не, не зняв, бо я, я якраз вертався задом і там вже, вже запис виключив. Але загалом картинка, картинка весела була. Thomas Tainer, an Italian military analyst and an expert on NATO, writes about this. Number one, lack of winter clothing for the Russian troops, death from hypothermia. Poor Russian logistics, no new clothes, no new food on the front lines, death from hypothermia. No shelters, no dugouts for the Russian forces, leaving them exposed to the elements death from hypothermia. The ground is frozen because of winter and low temperatures. They cannot dig new trenches soon. They cannot dig dugouts. Death from hypothermia. Russian troops cannot start a fire because the smoke from the fire is detectable by Ukrainian drones which will result in artillery missions on them. Frozen ground means that artillery missions will become more efficient because in the summer shells penetrate into the earth. If the ground is frozen, the explosion is forwarded around the area. More shrapnel. The last point, the seventh point, frozen ground means no trenches, but... What you're about to witness in this video, it's the Russian military police arresting people who's been recently mobilized for refusing to go up to the front lines. What is interesting for me to point out, look at this guy. Look at his sleeves. Look how he's dressed. And look at the military police. Just look at this. Oh yeah, and of course the fat guy in charge, just in case, how are you going to a front line? And here comes the military police. But look at this, they've been dressed pretty well. They have Kevlar's, they have helmets, they have a case. And they just arrest the guy who's pretty much look like more of a, a bomb. God, I guess bombs are dressed better than him. And look at the other guys. Yep, up you go. Here you go. Those guys' uniform fits just well. Oh my god. Look at that. Look at this. And this guy. Hey, Frodo. Short enough not to be ready to die on the front lines? Do you want to do this? Well, Bilbo is waiting for you in a vehicle. This is... This is sad. But the revolt is here. Okay, here you go. Right up there. On the bright side, this guy's gonna live. Well, those guys gonna live. Good choice, guys. And for the rest of that poorly dressed set people who may be hating us, I advise you to choose life. Like those guys did. Yeah, Russians have a lot of blue on blue because to avoid blue on blue you need a lot of coordination between units and you need excellent communications from all levels but communication has been one of the weakest link in the Russian military they have gone to open communications months ago because they were lacking radios because you know Russian military equipment list there were no radios so Ukrainians are, are tapping these radios they're listening to them and Russians are ordering fire at anything they see and sometimes it's their own unit there's reports of multiple explosions at an airbase pretty deep inside of Russia today. Ukraine hasn't claimed responsibility for this, and technically it could be an accident, but given multiple detonations, that seems unlikely. The airbase here, Ingalls 2, is the same one that saw a pretty significant increase in strategic bomber activity last week. A couple things to note here. Ingalls is more than 400 miles from the front lines, which means this is the deepest strike inside of Russian territory since the start of the war. Now, the U.S. says they haven't sent any attackums to Ukraine to be fired out of the HIMARS, but... 400 miles is even outside of their range. And just a few days ago, Ukraine announced that they're testing a drone that can fly over 600 miles with a 75 kilogram warhead. Now, whether it's related or not, as I'm recording this on December 5th, it sounds like there's an ongoing Russian missile strike all across Ukraine. Why do you think um, Russia didn't do what they did in Donbass and in Crimea? Like that was successful. What they did in Crimea was successful. They went in there with these little green men and the whole world knew they were Russians, but we somehow treated it like they weren't. And 
by 2020, everyone kind of viewed Crimea as Russian. W what do you think changed to where they were like, nah, <laughs> let's send in tanks? I think he got greedy. For Putin, as much as I know him by looking at what he does, it's very important to him. He, his idol is Peter the First, the great expansioner, the great, like he almost Europeanized Russia, the great dude in Russia, the great Tsar. He wants to be like him and he's old. He got to make, he needs to make the moves now. And I think he got greedy with it. That's your boy. Тоже спасибо мне, пожалуйста. Знаешь, я тебя люблю даже сильно. today's top story and I want to talk about what's going on in Ukraine. So NATO countries are starting to realize something, starting to wake up to something. They are about to lose their war in Ukraine against Russia. It is a NATO war after all, unless they do something dramatic. Now dramatic. they they have thrown out all of their weapons. They've thrown all of their weapons and ammunition into Ukraine, so much so that the US is running out of ammunition and weapons which the Washington Post reported and confirmed by the New York Times. Germany can't build tanks because they can't process the, the steel required to build them right now. And things don't stop now. Ukraine will be destroyed. It will cease to exist as a country. Now, we've been saying this since the start of the war. Of course, Noam Chomsky said it. And many experts we've had here on the show have said it. That there's only two ways this ends, right? Either there is a settlement, a peace settlement, or Ukraine no longer exists as a country. And it looks like they're going with the second option right now. The Biden administration, NATO leaders are going with the second option. So here is Colonel Douglas McGregor, friend of the show. He's been on a course a number of times. Now he did an interview yesterday and I love this quote and I wanted to feature what Colonel McGregor said. He said, the fact that in his foreign policy, Biden's take no prisoners conduct of U.S. foreign policy means the outcome of the next phase of the Ukrainian war will destroy the Ukrainian state. So what does he mean by that? Well, we've got some staggering evidence that I'm going to show you in a minute about how the Ukraine military is destroyed and it's being run by contractors and, and NATO forces. Here's just some of the evidence. Um, if you've thought things were winding down, you know, now that Republicans have taken control of the House of Representatives and they, you know, they said, maybe we're not going to have this endless purse strings that are available to just keep putting us further, further into war. No, uh, it's not happening. Not happening at all. Things are actually about to get much, much worse. So overnight, a massive drone strike. Take a look at this strike inside of Russia. This is inside of Russia. Destroyed an oil depot again inside of Russia which has reservoirs of oil products that are right now on fire, and they're still trying to put this out. Rescue teams at the scene trying to put out this fire, according to the Telegraph. And here's just a, a, a graph from the Telegraph that I want to point out. So here's the headline. Drone strike in Russia border town sparks fire at oil depot. Uh, there was an unidentified bomb drop from drones. So where are those drones coming from? Of course, they're coming from the United States. Supply of drones to Ukraine. And let's be clear, these drones what? are run by and guided by the United States. David's back. Yes, I'm back. And I wanted to say, like, I'm shocked that the U.S. isn't there guarding the oil fields now, like guarding the, the, the oil so that it doesn't get out of hand. So no, like it's, we did in everywhere else we go. No, no, they'll go to Syria and they'll steal the oil. We'll go to Syria and steal the oil. We'll go to uh, we'll go to Haiti and steal your oil. We'll go to other places and steal your oil. But in 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 Moscow, we'll we'll bomb it and destroy it so that you, that, so you can't send it to Germany. So, like, see how this, like, circular, <laughs> you know, circular uh, logic well, works? Appreciate that. That's what we're doing with their oil. That's what we do with the other natural resources. But in this case, we can't go in and exploit their oil, so we just blow it up. Now, this is happening not just in this town where this oil, it's happening all over the Belgrade area. It's happening in multiple cities along these border towns in Russia. 
And it's just a matter of time before all hell breaks loose. Now, you saw the muddy tracks, the muddy, the muddy fields that we've been showing you over the past few days. So they're just sitting and waiting right now. But they've made ma the Russian army has made major advances and has picked up a lot of territory and has repelled a, a number of NATO advances over the past 24 hours. Um, but here's just one sentence out of this Telegraph piece that I wanted to highlight for you. Um, it follows a pattern, these attacks, alleged attacks by Kiev, suggesting it has increased its capability of striking into Russian territory. Oh, into Russian territory, which was heretofore not something possible by them. So the longer range weapons are now arriving just in time to strike into Russia. And then today we heard from the EU leaders on what they want from Ukraine. They want Ukraine to be totally destroyed by launching long range attacks inside of Russia towards Moscow, because that's what will happen. So here's the headline. EU country urges Ukraine to strike Russia. Now, this is Latvian foreign minister Edgars Rinkiewicz urging NATO to allow Ukraine to use its Western supplied weaponry for strikes deep into Russian territory, deep into Russian territory. The top diplomat made the remarks in an interview with Bloomberg said in particular, the weapons should be used to attack sites used by Moscow to stage missile strikes against Ukraine's critical infrastructure. So we got to step this up. We really need to start striking inside of Russia using NATO weapons, long range heavy weapons, but there's no Ukrainian army really at all really left to do this. So who's going to be directing those missile strikes? It's not Ukrainians. Are you out of your freaking mind? You, we're going to let Ukrainians use high Mars launching heavy weapons we're going to let them direct drone strikes with our have thermal cameras and other sniper equipment at their disposal anti-sniping professionals are able to determine the position of a shooter even by sound rifle bullets travel at supersonic speeds and make a clicking sound as they pass by a second after the supersonic click you can hear the sound of a shot even if the rifle is with a silencer in the silence of the night this is easier to do the sound of the gunshot travels at 1,100 feet per second. The time difference between the supersonic click and the sound of the shot can be used to estimate the approximate distance to the sniper's position. Further actions are not similar to films about sniper duels. Nobody hunts a sniper with a sniper rifle. The sniper's coordinates are transmitted to the artillery. After that, the position is fired upon from howitzers or mortars. Also, a volley is often made from the MLRS. A volley of 300 millimeter caliber rockets strikes an area of up to 67 hectares. In one volley of MLRS, 393,984 ready-made fragments. If someone falls under such a volley, then there is no chance of surviving. The Ukrainian sniper decided to be proactive and meet the Russian reconnaissance group on the way back. To do this, he and his assistant settled down in between the hills just before the crossing to the eastern bank of the river. The sniper had to move faster than the reconnaissance group and then quickly climb the hill. The Russian reconnaissance group was walking in a forest belt, so their journey took longer. The shooter had time to catch his breath. In case of failure, the sniper could go to the opposite slope of the hill. However, the idea was still risky because in the gray zone, you never know what awaits you in the next second. In addition, the opposite bank is densely covered with forest, which is always a source of danger, and the sniper's position between the hills is hidden only by grass. At the very crossing, the reconnaissance group had to leave the forest. The Russians acted competently. First, one fighter came out onto the country road, and then two more. The sniper continued to wait for the others to emerge from the forest, the distance to the target did not exceed 1,900 feet. This can be judged by the image in the optical sight. Those were the longest seconds of his life. Ukrainian Special Operations Forces snipers are armed with UAR-10 semi-automatic sniper rifles. There are also heavy long-range rifles chambered in 338 Lapua Magnum or 50 BMG. But in this battle, the UAR-10 was used. This is an analog of the American AR-10. Caliber 308 Winchester is designed for the destruction of manpower. The UAR-10 has a range of 3,900 feet and a rate of fire of 21 shots per minute. The shooter had 10 rounds in the magazine. 
When the other members of the reconnaissance group entered the country road, the sniper opened fire. The first shot is the hardest. The point of impact of a cold barrel is higher than that of a hot one. Russia says that the United States and NATO are at a war with them because of their aid to Ukraine. With some saying if Russia truly believes this accusation that they've made at least seven times this year, they should just attack NATO. Except we all know that Russia is A, scared of NATO, and B, full of shit. Plus, Western aid to Ukraine is not an active war, nor is it a proxy war. It's a country getting assistance in defense. Russia is apparently worried that enemies of Russia could use hypnosis to overthrow Sad Vlad. Because if you don't remember, the list of other things Russia's been scared of during this war include biomutant soldiers, gay bombs, witches and sorcerers, black magic, robot mosquitoes, and British people. For a country that doesn't Celebrate Halloween. They have quite the imagination. There's rumors of a new peace deal that was written by Western countries, initially accepted by Ukraine and transmitted to Russia. Let me know what you think. It's outlined in a National Interest article titled The Peace Proposal in Russia, Shadows of Versailles. It calls for an end to hostilities, for Russian forces to leave Ukraine, including the Donbass. It would establish a 100-kilometer security zone between Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia to be patrolled by six Western nations. NATO membership for Ukraine would be tabled for seven years. Crimea would become neutral, and the Russian Navy would leave the Black Sea. I think this proposal kind of hinges on the idea that Putin is running out of options when it comes to the war in Ukraine. I don't know. What do you think? Is it a good plan? Does it have any chance of success? We don't ever really talk to you about. I tell you, this is the kind of like flexibility you have to have, or mental endurance that you have to have from getting shelled day in, day out. A lot of war isn't going on assault every single day. Holding ground, then moving forward, holding ground, holding, defending, and getting shelled every single day, and then having to be somewhat okay with all this. <laughs> Good days and bad days. Grateful to be here. Be alive. And we don't have the Soviet Union, we have very weak, uh, actually despicably weak Russia under Vladimir Putin trying to conquer its neighbor and failing at every stage. Most of people, when they asked, uh, they without thinking would say, of course, the Soviet Union was the last empire and uh, consequently it collapsed. And they would add now, of course, that the collapse of the Soviet Union is not over. We, we're seeing the war in Ukraine and the Russian Federation maybe will collapse as well. Uh, but what I want to say that as I investigated the energy of nationalism inside the Soviet Union, I found the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, of course, very intent on mobilizing and leaving the Soviet Union. Explosive nationalism, violent nationalism in, in Georgia and the South Caucasus in general, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia. But uh, in general, Ukraine was quiet. Russia was quiet. So I asked myself a question, was this net energy of uh, secessionist nationalism and nationalism in general sufficient to destroy, let's call it the empire, let's call it the yes. Soviet empire. And I found it deficient. It was only when a so-called Brexit occurred, and I call <laughs> it Brexit, of course, after Brexit, when Russia, the largest, uh, by far, the largest republic or federation rather than the republic out of the 15 that constituted the Soviet Union, declared to everyone's surprise a declaration of sovereignty in June uh, nine, uh, 1990. And that was, they, under, that was under Yeltsin? This was Yeltsin's deed, but it was still under Gorbachev. So Gorbachev... Yes. Uh, and it, the rest of the world looked at it in total amazement. And in my book, I quote uh, Brent Scowcroft, who then was a national security advisor, President Bush in, in the White House, and said, and we all look as in astonishment at the fact that Russians turned against the state that we always considered their own. 
the Soviet Union and Russia were, you know, basically the same thing for 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 for, rest, for the rest of the world. And all of a sudden, the Russian Federation declared it, it would be, you know, like England declaring secession from the United Kingdom. Gorbachev goes to Beijing. He was in Beijing when the students there, the Chinese yes. students wanted him to talk to him, and he refused. He said, you know, it's a this Chinese uh, affair, but he returned back home with his clear conviction. Look, some people told me that I use, uh, I should be authoritarian, and I should gradually, gradually release this energy of people while improving economy. But look at what is happening in Tiananmen. I don't want the Red Square to be like Tiananmen. So he persevered in democratization, which, by the way, was popular among Chinese students enormously at the time. But students were crushed. And here we are. We have this enormous China as a result of authoritarian uh, yes. uh, reforms of Deng Xiaoping. And we don't have the Soviet Union who have very weak uh, actually despicably weak Russia under Vladimir Putin trying to conquer its neighbor and failing at every stage. So, you know, going back, who was right? Dan Xiaoping and Gorbachev. Uh, perhaps it's too early to ask. We've been back to this map many times and battles going fits and starts, but this one is now starting to show some movement. The Russians <clears throat> have tried to uh, uh, take Bakhmut, both from the uh, frontal attack from the east, from the north, but now they've gone round to the south and they may be having some success. When I say the Russians, I'm talking about the Wagner Group, the mercenary group, who are determined to take Bakhmut, although it doesn't have a great deal of strategic value. But they've got this ground to the south. They're probably only about four or five kilometres away. But it's all very open ground. And they're having to attack across very open country. The Ukrainians are hitting them night and day with artillery, so much so that the Pentagon is even worried that the Ukrainians are using up too much artillery uh, in defending Bakhmut. The, f the fighting around there is absolutely ferocious. I was looking at some footage overnight of night attacks uh, that, that the Wagner Group were trying across this open ground, and it just, somebody said, it's a vision of hell. It's just alive with fire and flame all night long. Um, we'll see how that goes. I mean, the Russians may get towards the outskirts of Bakhmut, but my goodness, they're paying a price for it. And the issue is, even if they take Bakhmut, it won't matter if they lose at Kremena further north. And that's where the essence of the rest of this battle will take place. <clears throat> the Russians occupied Kremena and Svatove further north of that. That's the main communication lines. The Ukrainians have been attacking Kremena in particular in recent weeks, and it looks as if the Ukrainians are now having some, some real success. They got round partly to the, the south, but in the north, they've got round and they've taken the Chevano Popivka. And Chevano Popivka is actually quite a small village, but it's very important because it allows the Ukrainians to get to encircle most of Kremena, then Kremena will fall. And if Kremena falls, that becomes effectively the hinge that will open up northern uh, Luhansk, and in particular may allow, may allow the Ukrainians to start to get round the back of, of Russian forces in Severodonetsk and Lysyshansk, remember those places? A hundred days the Russians tried taking Severodonetsk, which they eventually did, and they took Lysyshansk a bit more quickly after that. But if they lose in Kremena, if they give up Kremena, then the Ukrainians have got a much clearer run to try to make big inroads into Russian defences. And if they lose the P-66 highway, which they have already lost control of, then the Russians will be pushed back about 30 kilometres east uh, to Starobilsk before they can really establish a new, another line to dig in. So things are getting very, very critical for them at Kremena if the Ukrainians can keep up the momentum of their attacks. Meanwhile, we still think about how the Russians are reacting to these attacks on air bases. The, the air base, the Diaglivo air base uh, up in uh, Ryazan, uh, the Engels II air base in Saratov, and the, uh, near the air base in Kursk. It wasn't actually at the air base. It was a, uh, a, a fuel dump that was in between the airport and the air base itself. <clears throat> the point is the damage in these three places wasn't great, but the fact that they were attacked at all is really important. Now, the State Department in the last 24 hours have made it very clear that it's nothing to do with them. They were not attacked with American weapons or weapons that the Americans have given to uh, the Ukrainians. These were apparent attacks with Ukrainians uh, own weapons, weapons that they have adapted, that they don't have any role in the planning, it's nothing to do with them. It's very important that the Americans make it clear that this is a Ukrainian-only attack. Meanwhile, uh, President Putin is dealing with 
uh, some very angry people on Russian Telegram channels who are furious that, that a, apparently a drone, a 1970s drone, a, an old Soviet Red Army drone, was used, apparently, in these attacks so deep into Russian territory and wasn't intercepted. And that's a big problem. President Putin met with his Security Council yesterday. He hasn't said anything yet today. We will see if there's some sort of retaliation or some sort of response that comes out of it. But it, above all, President Putin has now got to deal with the increasing anger inside Russia, not just in military circles, but in the media, that these attacks could take place at all in a conflict that is still supposed to be a special military operation to remove the government in Kiev. The US military is tripling its production of artillery rounds, saying they want to build their stocks higher than they were at the start of the war, and the plan being to outproduce the Russians all by ourselves and to make sure that the US is able to give Ukraine what it needs, with this being a part of larger goals of restocking US inventory so it can continue to aid Ukraine while also replenishing its own stock at the same time, and the US notably already supplying Ukraine with over 1 million artillery rounds. I've heard a lot about this, but this is the first video I've seen of a Gepard right there shooting down a Russian drone or cruise missile. It wasn't the guy with the AK. Germany donated, I think, 30 of these to Ukraine. They have twin 35 millimeter auto cannons and can do some real work against slow moving targets. Yeah. Maybe 200 meters. What was that? Stolen or something, this fucking cock. That was like, what, 150 meters, maybe? Uh, I guess that's why we're wearing body armor, PPE. I didn't even hit the body. Hit me right now. You okay? Yeah. Nathan, you good? So I've got my lid on. So I've got my lid on. Maybe next time. Jesus Christ. What a hell of a way to wake up. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, yeah, man. Fuck me, man. Hey, you got those products? This fucking that piece of paper? Yeah. I was sitting there talking to Swagger. I was like, you guys ever gotten hit while you're sitting here? I was like, fuck. Dude, where the fuck is it coming from? Throwing donkey, man. Hey. Fucking push up into this. Let me see your weapon. So, what do I think of the rumors the Ukrainians have lost a hundred thousand troops in the war? Personally, I don't believe it. Well, look, man, I don't know. I'm very skeptical of any numbers because even as a historian, it can be hard to gauge, you know, the amount of people killed in a past war. 
So even just getting good estimates of how many people were killed, say, in Iraq, or how many people were killed in Vietnam, is very difficult. So when we're throwing around estimates of um, you know, how many soldiers have been killed in an active war that's going on right now, uh, I'm skeptical of any round numbers. So I, I don't know if it's 100,000, I don't know if it's 50,000, you know, uh, I couldn't, um, you know, give an opinion on that. What I can tell you is uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Ukrainians have suffered an awful lot of casualties. So a lot of the combat, especially early in the war, was very artillery intensive. And the Russians had a serious artillery advantage over the Ukrainians. Uh, that was as high as like five to one for a while there, just because of the number of artillery tubes the Russians had in the, their stockpiles of munitions. That's been brought back to almost a one to one now, where it's about even. And that's because the Russians are running out of artillery, uh, they're running out of uh, ammunition, they burned through a large portion of their stockpile. And also because the Ukrainians have been able to leverage the increased range and precision of Western systems to target uh, Russia's artillery capability, things like HIMARS, and also just uh, the M777, its range and accuracy. So they've been doing that by uh, things like counter battery fire, which means targeting their artillery with your artillery, going after their guns, but also going after the supporting infrastructure that supports the artillery itself. So, um, you know, command and control uh, elements, and most importantly, ammunition stockpiles and, and radars and things like that. And they've been using HIMARS to great effect to do that. So we could actually see a future where the Ukrainians have an artillery advantage over the Russians, um, you know, next year maybe. But in any case, what this means is this massive use of artillery, especially when the Ukrainians are you know, relying largely on infantry. They have a, a pretty infantry heavy force, uh, as you would expect, considering how large their mobilization has been. It doesn't surprise me at all that they have suffered an awful lot of casualties. If you fling that much high explosive at someone, you just, you're going to suffer casualties. You just will. You know, we think of World War One, like how casualty intensive that war was. And that was because of the massive use of artillery. So it doesn't surprise me at all that many, many Ukrainians have had to give their lives and their health in the defense of their nation. Um, what I will tell you, though, is I, will be sh I would be shocked. In fact, I just wouldn't believe any estimate that put Russian casualties as higher than Ukrainians. Uh, the Russians have been on the offensive. They've often been attacking the Ukrainians in very heavily entrenched positions. And, uh, you know, that means they will, ha they will have suffered far higher casualty rates than, than the Ukrainians have. Uh, you know, two to one would be, you know, plausible to me. So, you know, if the, if the Ukrainians have lost 100,000, wouldn't surprise me if the Russians have lost 150 or 200,000. They've been using human wave tactics. Oi! 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 Rebel News, which is an alt-right conspiracy news organization, is going to Russia to get the opinions of Ukrainians to see what they think about the war. They sent a crew to Moscow where they intend on speaking to Ukrainians, Russians, soldiers, veterans, professors, and others to tell the other side of the story. What other side of the story? There is literally a genocide happening right now. Did you not see what happened in Bucha and some of those other towns? This is what the far right in Canada has devolved to. Spreading Russian propaganda by working with a former producer for Russia Today, which is literally the production arm of the Russian government. You know, that news organization that's been banned in most of the Western world because they were just promoting Russian propaganda. But I guess we should all be careful talking about rebel news because every time somebody talks about them, whether it's in a podcast or a TikTok, they decide to threaten with a lawsuit. Literally just the worst human beings. Yeah, okay! And that is what you call a miracle. That's seven meters away.
That's tank fire. You're meant to die from that. Seven meters away, you watch a tree disappear. You tell me you aren't meant to be here. Nobody likes holding ground. We'd rather assault tree lines. But sometimes that's the order. You don't understand pressure until you're actually here. That tree disappeared. Praise God. Sitting here with a Russian helmet and a US helmet over my kneecaps. Oh, tits. <coughs> That's a lot of pressure. <coughs> we lose a lot of guys. To contusions and shrapnel. Uh, time's passing uh, pretty pretty slowly but nevertheless it's uh, night's falling quickly uh, gotta get out of here uh, before it gets dark we know that but we, we really want to find this guy uh, before we leave because we think it's gonna be we think it's gonna be definitely the last chance to do so um, the uh, some of the artillery incoming has been deafening. Uh, you know, we're used to it from the, by now, but there's also the sound of machine gun fire, uh, which is not good news, <laughs> to say the least. And it's on three sides. It was on three sides, uh, which means that we're in a uh, salient, literally uh, kind of poked uh, into the Russian. Russian lines, or a better way to put it, the Russians are kind of closing around uh, this part of uh, Barnwood. So, aside from nightfall, we don't want to be driving the roads at dark. It's it's really dangerous. A lot of twitchy soldiers around, uh, but there's also the prospect, and of course, the infamous Wagner Group. Um, uh, uh, that's their job to infiltrate places like this. And Let's talk about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, along with the amount of military aid that has been given to Ukraine. Thus far, the US has given Ukraine about $18.2 billion in military assistance. Accounting for non-military assistance as well, that comes out to about $54.43 billion dollars. Combining all countries together who have given money to Ukraine, it comes out to about 93.8 billion euros or about 99 billion USD, though normally euros are worth more than the US dollar, but things are weird right now. There are a lot of people who are arguing against giving money to Ukraine. They think we're giving too much aid and we should be using that money for our own citizens. Simply put, they are wrong. After the collapse of the Soviet Soviet Union, Ukraine had the third largest nuclear stockpile in the world, and people did not like that very much because having more nuclear capable nations means there's a much higher chance of nuclear weapons being used. So the U Ukraine, the U.S., Great Great Britain, Russia, and I believe Belarus all got together and signed something called the Budapest Memorandum. And this was pretty much an agreement from Russia saying that they would not invade Ukraine, which they have broken, and the United States and Britain giving uh, Ukraine security assurances saying that we would protect them if Russia invaded them. To be honest, Ukraine got absolutely and totally screwed over by this. They had nuclear weapons, chose to give them up because they thought they had security guarantees, and then the US and Great Britain is like, well, it's more of security assurances. We made agreements in exchange for for Ukraine giving up its nuclear weapons to protect them and we are not following through on that. In all actuality, we should have soldiers in Ukraine fighting Russia, but we are not doing that. And then people want to act as if we're sending too much money to Ukraine. We signed agreements. We should follow through on those agreements. And yes, I agree. I do not want the US to go to war with Russia, but that does not mean we should not be sending them aid. We should be supplying them with as many weapons and as much money as they need. Furthermore, the strategic value of completely crippling Russia is absolutely amazing. 
If it only costs us 100 billion or 200 billion dollars to completely cripple Russia's military and make them no longer a world superpower, that is one of the best bargains ever made. Russia is quite literally killing itself by invading Ukraine. Furthermore, the people saying, oh, we're funding a proxy war. No, we are funding the defense of an independent nation which we agreed to defend and we're not even honoring the agreement to its full extent. And if $50 billion is just too much to give to an independent nation defending itself from an enemy authoritarian power, how about we take away the $233 billion in tax cuts we've already given to corporations in the US? Pentagon has given Ukraine the green light to conduct drone strikes inside of Russia, which is about to expose Russians to a whole new side of this war, and there's nothing the Russian state can do to stop it, except the whole leave Ukraine thing. The little boy Vlad doesn't seem too inclined to do that, and this is the Pentagon is looking to give Ukraine cluster munitions and long-range missiles. What we're seeing, uh, to put it in in one word is barbaric and precisely because Putin is not able to succeed on the battlefield he's taking the war to Ukraine civilians and he's doing it in a very deliberate way uh, going after the entire energy and electric infrastructure to turn off the lights to turn off the water to turn off the heat you will never wake up so conscious anxious why are you so scared of feeling pain bitch devil in your soul there is an anger in the Ukrainian people, a justified anger in the Ukrainian people that I think won't heal for generations. This is not going to be a war that when it ends, there's going to be a reconciliation commission where everybody hugs and, and, and makes up. That is not going to happen here. And uh, aside from Ukraine, Russia itself is going to suffer a fallout from this for decades and decades to come. People will not trust them again. People will not do business with them. This is going to affect, when this is over, it's not over. It's going to have long, long lasting effects, not just on Russia, Ukraine uh, relationship, but on Russia's relationship with the rest of the world. Putin is, let me choose my words very carefully. I'm prepared to speak with Mr. Putin if, in fact, there is an interest in him deciding he's looking for a way to end the war. He hasn't done that yet. If that's the case, in consultation with my French and my NATO friends, I'll be happy to sit down with Putin to see what he wants, has in mind. Today, the news out of Ukraine is Russia and Ukraine trading missiles in the south. Russia launched a bunch of drones, okay, not missiles, but they attacked Odessa and took out the power there. Meanwhile, Ukraine attacked Melitopol. And the thing is, though, this has been part of a sustained offensive. We've, we've been seeing attacks. If we zoom in here, right, Melitopol is right here in the center of Zaporizhia, and it is the linchpin. It's the logistics hub. And for several days now, Ukraine has been using probably high Mars missiles and increasingly they have drones, but they've been attacking targets, Melitopol up here at Takhmuk and along the front lines, right? And the Russians have set up defensive positions here. And so this is the hub. This is the key target in the area. And so they're at least doing operational interdiction. Maybe they're preparing for an offensive. If the bomb was 200 megatons, it would have a wave of thermal radiation that would reach a radius of 128.4 kilometers. The air blast radius would reach up to 109.2 kilometers, followed by electromagnetic wave of ionizing radiation that would reach up to 13.98 kilometers. The fireball would expand to a radius of 15.84 kilometers and would last for around 48.8 seconds. The total number of deaths by such a blast would amount to 2,954,474 people, almost killing every person living in the city of Kiev, which has a population of 3,010,000 people. Andy Melman, Federer of the Mozart Group. I'm in downtown uh, Eastern Barmud, actually, right now. We're in a salient in Barmud. Uh, Russians literally on three sides. Um, 
machine gun fires we came in not at us necessarily but there was uh, I mean not at us uh, but certainly a uh, combat very close by uh, Ukrainians very bravely are defending this town but the odds are stacked against them everyone knows that they're outnumbered um, the Russians have a huge weight of artillery hold on I'm getting out of the open here you can see the sky is perfect for drones we're here because this is the Mozart mile. This is what we mean. We're here to pull civilians out of this place. This may be the last chance we get to do it here. And I, I wanted to make this video just to illustrate that uh, this, isn't, this isn't just a phrase. It isn't just a catchy title. This is, what, this is what we do. Please donate whatever you can to keep us going. We're totally dependent on donor funding. Uh, every penny you spent is spent in places like this, helping people get out. Why should you do it? Moral clarity, humanity. I'm not sure I can offer a more compelling reason than that. Uh, that having been said, uh, this is this is definitely the end of my uh, of of this particular fun drive. My best to all of you. is not Russia. Ukraine will never be Russia. So fuck off, Putin. Russia launched at least 76 missiles at different parts of Ukraine. Today, they hit nine electricity generating facilities and also the capital of Ukraine. Representatives for the capital city say they were able to shoot down 37 out of 40 missiles launched at the capital. Out of the 76 missiles, 72 were cruise missiles, meaning they were shot from far away. The other four were guided missiles fired from an airplane. The book that helped save Ukraine. On February 24th, when Russia invaded Ukraine, I saw the Ukrainian government sending out messages for the civilians to resist. Well, I thought I could help. And on February 25th, I started sending out tweets on what I would do based on my personal experience and years of research into urban warfare if I was in a city trying to defend it from an invader. Well, those tweets went viral. Over 20 million people saw it. The tweets became images and tweets. And then eventually I put it together into a manual called the Mini Manual for the Urban Defender. Well, the Ukrainian government quickly put that out on their website for resistors, and the Ukrainian publisher published thousands of them. And they were found in Mariupol and Kyiv and Severodonetsk, all across the country. It had stuff like go out and block the streets, how to stay protected from incoming artillery fire, mortar fire, how to set up ambushes, how to do basic military aid, how to make water safe. And I hope it's, it's helped people. Well, the book is free and I just updated it version five. It's also been translated into over 14 languages because there is a need for people to resist invasion and resist subjugation across the world. A missile regiment of the mobile Yars took up combat duty today. The third deployment of such a system so far in just a few days. The Yars, which is being put into combat, is replacing the Topol model missile system. The video you are seeing was filmed in Bolivarsky, Russia, and was released by the Strategic Missile Force. For those curious, the RS-24 Yars strategic missile is a Russian MIRV-equipped thermonuclear armed intercontinental ballistic missile, fire tested on May 29, 2007. Russia has continued missile strikes on Ukraine this morning, being estimated to have fired as many as 60 projectiles at the state. The missiles hit multiple cities, with critical infrastructure appearing to be the main target once again. At least two people were reported as casualties in the southern city of Krivy Rig after a residential building was hit. Russia reportedly fired the missiles from positions in the Black Sea while using bomber aircraft as part of a large effort to distract anti-aircraft defences. In honour of David Letterman interviewing Zelensky, 
Zelensky. We have created the top five questions that Letterman didn't ask Zelensky. At five, does this war in actual fact date back to 2014 when the maiden coup financed by the United States displaced pro-Russian President Viktor Yanukovych and installed a new US-friendly president? Or did Boris Johnson's reported visit to Ukraine pressure you to end peace talks with Russia after Putin had said the terms you'd put forward to Russia were grounds on which he could negotiate? Three, is Putin solely to blame for the Western energy crisis when the nine largest energy utility companies in the US raked in nearly 14 billion in combined profits during the first three quarters of this year hmm. and dished out roughly 11 billion to uh -huh. their shareholders? Two, does the 60 billion dollars of aid and weapons given to Ukraine by the US government point to a proxy war with Russia or just a corrupt profiteering military industrial complex that will receive over half of the new 850 billion dollar Pentagon budget? The number one question, you're not a bit worried there might be a nuclear war and we'll all die. start with the basics. It's not Maiden, it's Maidan. It's not a coup, it's a revolution. And while your tanky Russian propaganda loving brain likes to think that we were always pro-Russian and then the US stepped in and made us pro-Western with an installed government, you could have just looked at the Ukrainian basic modern history and found out that before Viktor Yanukovych against whom we also had a revolution in 2004, we had an incredibly pro-Western president Viktor Yushchenko. He was very good, he just wasn't very effective. You could have found out that we were never pro-Russian. Actually, you know, we've been trying to separate from them ever since they started a first genocide and stole our history 400 years ago. Uh-huh. Oh, and babes, it wasn't a coup. The men fled like a rat from a sinking ship to Russia, where he actually belongs with his buddy buddy dictator Putin. Chris Johnson's reported visit to Ukraine pressure you to end peace talks with Russia. Tim, um, never said that. Our demands from the very beginning were the return of all of our sovereign territories, including Crimea and Donbass. What is there to negotiate if the man doesn't want to negotiate? He just wants to dictate people what to do. Boris Johnson doesn't decide for Zelensky. I don't know if you've ever heard of democracy, but we do. He represents us and our desires, and if Zelensky were to want to negotiate with Putin, we would have had another, what you would call, a coup, because that would not represent the desires of Ukrainian people. Mm -hmm. To Putin, solely to blame for the Western energy crisis when the nine largest energy utility companies in the US. Um, that seems like a question aimed at the US, not at Zelensky, you know? You mentioned Putin and Russia, and then you mentioned the United States. I did not see Ukraine mentioned anywhere near there, so why is that a question for Zelensky to begin with? And oh yes, Putin is responsible because, you know, he just merely started a genocidal war and decided to blackmail Europe with gas and oil. That, that would qualify as being responsible. In dollars of aid and weapons given to Ukraine by the US government point to a proxy war with... Okay, so here's the thing. This one actually pisses me off so much that I don't even want to be sarcastic or snarky here. No, the only 5.3% of the US annual defense budget that they gave us with weapons that were sitting there and dusting because they're old, which we're not complaining about, by the way, thank you, is merely helping Ukraine win against a genocidal invasion. That doesn't indicate a proxy war in any world other than the one where critical thinking doesn't freaking exist. But then again, it just dawned on me that I'm talking to Russell Brand, the critical thinking Russell Brand. Yeah, it doesn't exist in that world. I'll be worried there might be a nuclear war, I will- I'm a little bit worried that you're fear-mongering. Have you read any of the reports from actually qualified people who have told you a million, 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 bajillion times that that is not gonna happen because Putin is merely using nuclear war as a bargaining chip because he's desperate? Yeah, uh, yeah, from a, from a human perspective, you know, let's just all, let all Ukrainians die and be tortured in filtration camps because we're scared of World War III. But I'm not even gonna go there to explain it to you. But for all of you who are actually interested, please follow me over here on YouTube because I'm gonna be doing a longer form video over there breaking down all of these points and going in detail on why this man is a lunatic. Вот и все. Красавчики!
Russia is getting ready for the second wave of mobilization in January. The plan is to draft 500 to 700,000 new mobilized. Russians are starting to quietly be unhappy about authorities. They cannot understand the huge losses the mighty Russian army takes because in their propaganda shows it is the biggest and the best army in the world. Why do they need to mobilize? They're so strong. There's a huge error there. The Russians have this feeling of learned helplessness and apoliticalism. They feel like they cannot change anything in their country, so they don't even try anymore. They turn apolitical and then they turn to alcohol.